morning. Welcome back to my podcast, Victoria's Bowl. I'm Victoria. Um, I'm going to try to talk louder today. When I edit my videos, uh, I always have to take the volume up to like 400% because they don't talk loudly enough. Um, and that's just sort of normal, I think, for me. I'm a little more soft-spoken, unless I'm really ranting about something and I'm really riled up about it. I might talk louder, but uh, it's generally not something you'll see here. So I just talk really quiet. Hope you've been having a good week. It's Thursday. Uh, the week went really quickly, so I realized I needed to record today if I wanted it to be, want this podcast to be out tomorrow. Um, and it's early in the morning. Not super early, because I don't think 9.15 a.m. is super early, but the light right now is really, really dark in the morning. We live, we live in Washington State. It's pretty high north. We're more north than Maine, which I don't know if you've ever looked at a U.S. map, that Maine and Washington are not actually on the same level at all. We're on the, the level of um, Newfoundland, so it's really dark up here in the winter. Um, and we're about to do, I believe Daylight Savings is about to end or start. I can't remember which one it is, but we're going to get a whole hour back of light in the morning. Um, it's just pretty much like almost pitch dark at 7 a.m. when I want to get up so it's really hard and it's been raining it rained all day yesterday but like poured all last night and all this morning and waking up to this like just so dark so it's funny because um people think we've had like the Seattle has a reputation for being really rainy sort of in the 90s it was really rainy and then um we got, it's not that we got less rain, it just, we, yeah, we started having really drier, a lot drier summers and everything, and so sometimes, and we had a really dry summer this year, and so sometimes it's just, feels like a little bit like we get yanked around a lot about how the weather is here. It also doesn't pour very often, so I was just talking about, I have a friend who lives in Oklahoma, and, um, she was saying, she was saying how when it po rains there, it like dumps, like you get soaked really quickly. And here we don't even really carry umbrellas around very much because the rain is hardly ever really intense that you would actually get super wet and not be able to dry out. Today and yesterday were an exception for sure. Um, but that's why most of the time if you're in Seattle, you don't really see people carrying umbrellas. It's not because we're super tough. Like I always thought, it's just because our rain is really sort of misty and drizzly and inconsistent. So anyway, it has not been in the last couple days. I got a new cup. Um, it's from, I think, Screen Print Studios. I'll link below. It was, you know, um, it's not handmade. I do like the handmade look of cups. And, um, and I have like a thing for mugs and like, I don't know the aesthetic. So I have a lot of cups. Um, I think all the cups in the house pretty much are mine <laughs> that I've purchased. There's some that other people have purchased. But uh, the um, I just cleared out, like last year during the beginning of COVID, I cleared out a lot of mugs we weren't using. Like I could probably gave away like 30 to 40. We were just jammed full and it's just too much. And I still had like maybe 30 after that that were like beloved and like absolutely needed to keep them. And so I've been adding a little bit this year and um, this is one of them. It's a pretty little chevron shape. Um, probably the big news this week is that I made it a whole year without buying yarn. And uh, the date was October 31st. It was Halloween. I ordered in 2020 some yarn and I waited until yesterday, which was November 3rd. Um, so I didn't buy anything for an entire year and uh, it was crazy because it got really easy, um, really big, 
really big mile um restrictions like that can work really well for me um and but it was still something i i never thought i would have been able to do and uh i did it so i had a count a counter on my phone that i could look at every once in a while and see how many days it had been and i was gonna do six months i think originally and then six months is really easy and i have all this yarn so i was like i might as well just go for a year and i did but i bought la yarn last night so um i got some birthday money it was my birthday last week i had a little sale thank you for the few, the people that um bought patterns that was nice of you and uh i what i want to say about that <laughs> lost my turn of thought um I got some birthday money for a yarn shop, a local yarn shop here. I got money for tol yarn and wool. So I was trying to find a pattern, I'm trying to look for patterns that would be really fun, like not design work or anything, just like something that I, you know, wanted to knit and would really enjoy. And I got a couple of different projects. And when I cast them on, I will show you more about them and stuff. But um, one of them is this, a little open cardigan it's called flam and I've already forgotten who it was by I haven't printed it out yet because I ordered yarn last night so I will definitely talk about it more next week because I'm pretty sure I'm going to cast on right away um it kind of will have a coloring some something like this this is a Brooklyn Tweed Loft and this is I think I was just looking at this I have the shade cards somewhere too this is the like white white color the whitest of the whites um, and this is Let Lopi in, uh, color 54. I think it's like light ash gray or whatever. Lopi's names, by the way, if you're ever shopping online for Lopi, you may have noticed that the names are different in different places. And so you really need to go by the numbers, the shade number. And this is 004, 54. So, um, I have a lot of Lopi. I have bought directly from Iceland many times in like large bundles because they, if they have a sale, um, the conversion rate of our money to their money, um, U.S. money to, uh, I think it's Kroner. Kroner is a really, really good deal. I think I probably got this ball of yarn for two bucks. Um, anyway, so I was looking for a whitish gray to buy for this sweater, and um, the yarn it came in couldn't find anywhere in the United States. There are some yarn shortages. Let me know if you've noticed that too. I'd love to hear about like any updates on yarn companies worldwide. I just think that after looking last night, cause I haven't really shopped for a year after looking last night for like certain things, it was really hard to find stuff. Um, so it does seem like there is ha there's some shortages trickling down finally. Um, but I did settle on getting Brooklyn Tweed Shelter and I got Snowbound. I didn't get, I have this colorway, but I don't have quite enough. And um, I wanted something a little bit more gray. This, however, I think is a little too itchy for what I was thinking. I, I am knitting a card, an open cardigan in Let Lopi in like a dark black heathered colorway. I don't want to have two cardigans on needles, both in Lopi because I love this yarn. I have so much of this yarn. I love the projects I've made with this yarn, but it is not very bouncy. It's pretty twine. It's pretty um, string-like, and so it's for my hands. The way that I knit, it's hard on my hands. It doesn't matter whether it's Let Lopi or Puda Lopi or Alifas Lopi. It doesn't matter. Um, I haven't really knitted at a loose gauge. I was gonna knit a shawl, design a shawl, and something with this. Um, I don't think I would mind it being against my skin kind of maybe like a shawl more that you'd like wear like a little bit looser rather than something close up so um we'll see if I knit it looser as I have knit a really a lot of really dense dense lopy sweaters and that was those were hard on my hands anyway I don't want to do two lopy sweaters at the same time so I went with the Brooklyn Tweed and um which is much softer it's the Columbia I believe it's Targi the way you pronounce that yarn breed so it's um, much softer um so that'll come in the next couple days it's nice ordering 
online from a close sh shop that's close by because you get it you get it super quickly um i order rather than go there because i live on an island so i have to get on a ferry it takes me it takes me like two hours to get there which is not a big deal if it's like a destination thing it's told it's such a great great shop um but two hours to get there two hours to get home so it's like a four hour trek when everything that they have in their store is available on and they ship it to me within a couple days so I should be able to start so I'm really excited about that um I did also get some reddish wine color burgundy um mohair and wool folk for the broom brom brom hat by Melody Huffman which is just like a sort of basic one by one beanie that I've been wanting to make for a long time and I wanted that color that she knitted in or something really close to that. So I was looking for like just the right, it's a mohair neutrogen blend. So I was looking for just the right combination and I think I've found it, we'll see. Anyway, so yay for a year with no yarn. If that's what you wanna do, you should try it out. Just give yourself like a little goal. I think I started out with like two months Last year around this time, I wanted to not buy yarn for the rest of the year and I easily did that. And I wanted to go six months and I easily did that and I wanted to go a year. You know, it's going this long, I will say, looking back and the experience I had the last couple of days, it does change you and how you buy, um, which it should. If it's gonna be sustainable, something that, some, something that I could actually do for a whole year, it really does change the way that I think about buying. And I had a really hard time choosing patterns the last couple of days to use my birthday money on. And I I would put things in the cart and then I'd be like, I'll think about it. And I never did that before. I was, I'm was i a very impulsive decision maker um, or, I, or, or I just won't make a decision. So that's kind of what I was doing. I was just not making a decision the last couple of days. Um, and I bought, I bought all so much yarn because I would just buy whatever I felt like drawn to or what what seemed really exciting or somebody would have you know yarn up on instagram and i'd i'd buy it and that's why i ended up with this just huge stash um and so it was really challenging to find something to find something that i knew that i really wanted to do that would and i just had all this weight and all this pressure because it's like you know it's birthday money so i wanted to go as as far as possible and to be really be something i really liked and i wanted the like i picked a white like that's i don't know if i if i've ever knit a white thing have i ever knit a white thing i've i've knit a couple of oatmealy sweaters one oatmealy cardigan but I kept, well, I could do this in any, I mean, I had the yarn that's suggested in the pattern. I actually have three sweater quantities of that yarn. <laughs> and I was like, oh, but I want a white one. I have gray, I have a blue, and I have this really beautiful brown. And um, I just wanted the white. I liked how it looked in the picture a lot. I liked the simplicity of it. And I really liked how you know after having knit like 20 hand knit sweaters and many seasons going through you know wearing just those sweaters that I've made myself you know at least three or four years now every winter like watching what I what I pull out off the shelf and what I wear a lot and what fits with like when I leave the house which is not that much now but when I leave the house like what am I wearing like what where are their holes in like Oh, I wish I had a sweater that was like this or would go with this outfit or whatever. And that takes, I, that takes some like just experience and practice to know what you're missing or what you use. And, um, I think more basic color sweaters, fortunately, <laughs> are the thing that I often think, oh, I wish I had a black something, or I wish I had a simple da da da. So I probably need to make more of those, even though I just, you know, I really love knitting exciting things. Um, and I was saying this to my mom, I'll pull, it's the head of the sweater over here. I'll grab it really quick. I was saying this to my mom about, you know, I'm picking a white yarn for patterns. Um, I was wearing this. 
which is this is a good night day pattern that I use scrap Malabrigo with. It's a big chunky, I used like five different scraps of Malabrigo I had and, and I knit it. I think I knit it a couple times because, pardon the birthday balloons, they're losing their, their air. I do have um, a big one too. <laughs> um, yeah, has big sleeves. It's kind of cropped a little bit. And um, it's not like an easy sweater to wear out because it's bigger, it like doesn't fit under my coat very well. Um, but it's very colorful. And it was a little cold yesterday in the house, so I, so I pulled it out. I pulled it out because it was, cardigans are like the thing you just like put on real quick. And shawls are kind of like that too. Like if I'm not super cold, like I don't need a whole sweater, then cardigans or shawls or anyway, that's a good segue to me putting this on. Um, suffice it to say, I need to knit some boring things to fill holes in my wardrobe. So I, I bought a white sweater for our white cardigan. This is Cumulus Skies. This is a crescent shape shawl. It alternates between garter in the Siri alpaca and the herringbone in the Superwash Juicy DK, Ju Juicy DK from the Farmer's Daughter. The Siri, it's called Odang, the Siri alpaca. It's also from Farmer's Daughter. It has all this little, these little brown flecks that are mirrored in the blue flecks, the brown flecks that are in the blue. Um, this is a collaboration with Farmer's Daughter from 2019, 19, I think. Um, how do I want to wear it first? There's a couple different ways that I do this one. Um, the blue is a custom colorway for Tolt yarn and wool. Um, I probably should not have used it considering that I don't know if they sell it year round or if they just sell it in the summer. I'm not sure. You'd have to call them and ask them because <laughs> um, you can't get it from Farmer's Daughter directly. You have to buy it through Tolt. But they do make, Tolt does make a very, very similar color. I think it's called something man, mountain man, maybe. That's this just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful blue. And I'll have to put in the show notes the colorway name of both the exclusive colorway and the Siri Alpaca because I'm not remembering right now. I just don't remember those pattern details after it's been a few years. Um, but I pulled this out today because I posted about it on Instagram yesterday and um, it's so warm. The Siri really is, the re a reason I named it Cumulus cumulus skies is because it really does to me look like you've got like strips of blue sky with you know the brown flecks in the in the white kind of give it that like cloud like and plus it's just fluffy and when you take pictures of it it just glows so it's really really pre so pretty um and uh it's very narrow like it doesn't have a lot of depth to it, which is just really nice sometimes because shawls get so big. I like a big wingspan. I like to be able to do things with it. <laughs> like it's not like this little thing that you can't quite keep on. So I like bigger wingspans, but I don't always want a lot of depth because it adds a lot of weight to your neck and shoulders. And I don't know if you've ever had like sore neck from a scar, a shawl, and it shouldn't do that. Um, well, it's not that it shouldn't because things do what they do. But it's nice if some of the shawls I, still, I wear don't do not do that. So this is super lightweight because of the Surrey. So it's also just in general like a, a lighter shawl. Um, I did put a little garter bit at the beginning. So it's only two, two stripes of herringbone just because this part gets tucked up under your neck or hair anyway. So like why do it? 
um, and the herringbone. You do have to keep track of where you are. You do need your, your knits and um, it's such a cool stitch. I'm looking at it and being like, how did I make this? Um, it's not pearl stitches. It's sort of like, it's like, um, looks like floats, you know, in color work that just sort of get pulled along. And it was, it's a super fun pattern to follow. I was posting on Instagram this week about how I spent a lot of time trying to make my knitting patterns really accessible. Um, I feel like I follow in the school of Andrea Mowry, whose patterns are incredibly clear and well-written. And as a newer knitter, I was probably really getting into pattern, didn't you, following other people's patterns um, in 2016. And I remember, heck, I remember where I was when I found her. I remember where, what city I was in, what cafe I was in. I found her Talia shawl and just, I literally went from that cafe over to the yarn store. This is in Eugene, Oregon, when I lived there. Um, I immediately went to the local yarn shop where everybody knew me and I was like, I have to make this right now and I want to buy yarn for it. And I was just like obsessed immediately because, well, I was obsessed immediately and so surprised, happily surprised to find out her patterns are really easy to follow. And so that was how I um, sort of started in on this whole pattern writing journey was really following pattern writers who I, who just clicked with me and made sense with me. And, um, I want, want that to be part of what I do in my patterns. So I spend a lot of time trying to make things as repeatable as possible so that you're not looking at tons of lines of text. And I also want, um, the wording to be really easy to follow and try to give as many like instructions and, um, notes and stuff and there's tutorials in there for anything that might be a little tricky and uh just got to keep track of where you are and that about that about you know keeping track of where you are i print my patterns out physically everybody's different so if you follow digitally or you have one of those like the knit companion or some sort of digital tool where you can mark where you are or whatever that's awesome um but like creating a system for yourself where you are able to track your progress is incredibly important when you're following patterns. Um, and I have a little notebook. I think it's here. Maybe somewhere. I talked about it before. It's just like a little moleskin that um, I, when I'm following patterns or even my, when I'm writing my own patterns, if I'm doing something where I'm counting rows or I'm doing multiple things at the same time, say, say you're decreasing and cabling at the same time, I rewrite the rows out in the book in the little black book. I'll write the, t this is the section I'm on. These are how many rows you have to do. You're going to, I'm going to decrease here and I'm going to cable here and I'll rate a D and a C and I'll have this whole system that just sort of came about naturally. I didn't follow that of anybody else's. I just created something that really works for me. And, um, I just pulled out an older sweater. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and I flipped through my book. Oh, I worked on this last year, uh, earlier this year. So it should be a little bit flipping through pages and found it. I always title and I always date my pages and it said you're on row 17 of this section and I was like great and so I just looked at the name to make sure that you know I had notated it properly and I, I did I was right on and so I immediately started in so it took like less than five minutes to get back into a project I haven't worked on in six seven months so that that's the goal for me with note taking and, and tracking and stuff is I know exactly where I am in all the projects. Cause I had a bad experience when I first started following patterns, when I knit a sweater, I had to knit, I knit a sweater for four year period. And I had to rip out like half the body because I didn't know where I was. And I didn't know how to notate for myself yet. And I didn't understand the pattern all that well. And so I had to take the whole thing out. And, and I started notating really well at that point being like, I gotta be able to, I gotta be responsible for my own learning here. And Anyway, that's a side, side rant to say that this is cumulus guys. And, um, it's a very easy pattern. Just keep track of your herringbone rows. If you're having a lot of trouble with this, somebody emailed me this, this week or last week about, um, they were following, they were making Aya, the lace, pink lace and garter shawl that I have. And they were 
they got their lace roast messed up and they were asking me if I could help them and they fixed it before I was able to respond. But um, I was like, lifelines, like lifelines are not something you add after the fact, you add lifelines as you go. So if you have trouble with a particular type of stitch or you're worried about brioche is usually the one that people say, if you're gonna do brioche, add a lifeline in. Um, there are lots of videos about lifelines. Andrea Mallory just did an episode a couple episodes ago of her podcast talking about how to add in lifelines through the little hole on um, your interchangeable needles. If you have one of those sets, there's a hole here. See it? Wait, there you for it. You can kind of tell it's right at the base right there. That's for a lifeline. A lot of interchangeable needle sets have a little hole at the base of where they connect, where the needle tip connects to the cable. That's not for the connection at all. It's just sitting in there. And that's for you to add in a little bit of embroidery thread or some floss or something. And when you knit and there's a little bit of thread attached to that hole, you're dragging that, that through your stitches. And then it'll just sit in there, not hurting anything. And then you can pull it out if you don't need it. Or you, when you rip back, all those stitches are being held by the string. So I don't think I've ever done a lifeline. I just did one. What am I saying? I did one on my mitten pattern, um, which I don't need anymore and I can take it out. It's sitting here. It's this little blue section. I spent all this time getting the cuff of this new mitten design out that's coming out later with these cables. I've been talking about it for a couple weeks. I didn't make any progress on it. so. It's at the same spot, still need to cast off and still need to do the sum, which hopefully I will do today as soon as I'm done recording. Um, but yeah, I put a lifeline in because I ripped this cuff out like, I don't know, six, seven, eight times. So I was like, well, now the cuff's good and I'm going to do the hand and I, if I have to rip back, I might as well put a lifeline in. So it's sitting in there. Um, Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, anyway. Pattern writing is super fun. Learning to follow patterns is like this special code that you get to be um, in on. I've, I've had friends look at, oh, what do you do? You know, show me and I'll show them a pattern I wrote. And they're like, this isn't code. And I was like, yeah, it's another language. Like, I had to learn it. I love, I don't know, I kind of love that. Uh, I love that we have this shorthand that isn't necessarily standard straight across the board, but there are so many different ways of saying things. And I guess pattern writing is the right, one of the right jobs for me because I just love it so much. It's probably why I'm also like loving learning Korean because there's like these intricacies and order to things. And, and I, I actually really love writing Korean too. <laughs> I love speaking it, hearing it and writing it. So that's probably the whole language thing is really where that's at. Okay. I gotta move on. Last week's episode was super short. Um, and so this week's episode, I guess is going to be really long cause yeah. Uh, I haven't made any progress on the plant permit since last week. I just wanted it to make an appearance. <laughs> Here it is still in the same state. I worked a lot this weekend, and so I haven't, uh, but the people that I'm doing, the knitters that I'm doing the cowl for it are, we're starting to talk about doing the thumbs, so I gotta catch up. Ding, ding, ding. Um, do Cumulus Skies is available on my website and on Ravelry. Ding. Um, you can use mohair. You don't have to use cereal alpaca. Um, I think I used two, less than two skeins each. So it's not a terribly expensive shawl. If you want to get it from Farmer's Daughter, it's Juicy DK and Odang are the types of yarn. Um, but any, like I just bought some Isager mohair and there's so many different mohair companies out there. Uh, Magpie Fibers just started dyeing mohair. It's so pretty. Um, so one skein, if it's like one of those bigger skeins, it's like 400 something yards. 
Um, I think that's probably fine. How did I say that? Whenever you hear me talk about yardage stuff, if I say it only takes this, I'm just being like cute. And <laughs> you should really check the numbers that I write on my patterns and on Ravelry and stuff like that. Don't 100% trust what I say. <laughs> I hate to say that. Um, but I always, it makes me nervous when, um, when I hear myself say that after the fact. I'm like, ooh, make sure that you really do check with the pattern because everybody's gauges, every, gauges are people knit wildly different gauges. And so always check to make sure you have what the pattern, how many yards the pattern says, and also some extra because, man, I'd hate for anybody to not have enough, even though they bought two skeins. And gauge differences can be really, really subtle. I always, every test I get, every test I run, someone or multiple people always say, I got gauge, but my shawl is bigger or my shawl is smaller. And I know I've talked about that before. It's like beating a dead, <laughs> beating a dead horse, but like you don't knit the same gauge like here as you would like up here unless you're somehow like super super consistent and every stitch is like exactly the same tension that's just not how i knit so there's variations and those variations over the whole piece will you will use up different quantities of yarn so always get extra um there some, there's some patterns that say like i use I've, i don't know if you've come across this but like for a hat or something i used exactly two skeins I had so little yarn left. You probably need to get an extra skein. And I know that it's not often in people's budgets, but it's part of this, this whole dealio thing that uh, everyone's gauge is different and you might run out of yarn and, and we need to, you know, know what to do then. I wonder which to prevent that is to just get an extra skein. The sweater quantity of yarn I bought last night I'm thinking, I think I bought an extra, I didn't buy an additional extra skein, but I think I needed seven and I bought eight because I'm one well, different gauge, but you know, sweater, I try to be really, really close and gauge, if not spot on when the swatch doesn't mean I'll be spot on the whole time, but I also, um, I'm tall and then it's also three quarter sleeve and I think I'd prefer a long sleeve. So an extra skein is super helpful. If you want to make any adjustments or anything like that. Um, let's see. I think the only thing left to show you is ghost horses. So this is a pattern by Caitlin Hunter, Boyland Knitworks. And she specializes in awesome color work. Um, and I started this sweater in August of 2020. So it's been more than a year. It's gonna be a little cropped, little cropped one. Well, maybe not super cropped. We'll see. I can't decide whether or not I want it to like just hit the top of my high-waisted skirts or if I want it to actually tuck in. I don't know. Um, but I picked it up after many months and I've knit this month, this week about two and a half inches. I have my little lemon progress keeper. Yeah, it's a really fun. It was hard to get through the horse section. Um, I remember that being sort of like a trial. Um, this is spin cycle yarns, both their gray and their, um, Died in the wool, sport weight. I think it's called nostalgia, the purple one. It's my first time knitting with their yarns. It's really fun. Um, I, I guess I am concerned it's a little big because it's pretty fitted, but I'm just trying to acclimate myself to the fact that it's just not gonna be like that. It's just gonna be a little bit, you know, have more ease and that's fine. Really doesn't matter. Especially after all this time, I just want to be able to wear it. So I picked that back up 
and um, it's actually something I can knit on while I watch Korean TV because I have to read subtitles. So anything like super complicated, I have to stop the video and like, but with that, it's a repeat, all the color works a repeat of four stitches. So I can um, look down and go, oh, it's three purple, one white, or now it's one purple, one white. And I do that for a really long time, the whole way around. And so it feels a little bit more manageable, which is great because I watch a lot of Korean, te Korean television. Um, Last thing I want to do is wear this in a couple different ways for you. It's just the standard way. I kind of want to say like the missionary shawl <laughs> position. Um, this is how everybody does it. Um, but it's not very exciting or very interesting. So. Let's just play around here and see. Up to the side. That's kind of more fun. Um, the uh, way that I wear it, there's like different, I don't know if this is the case for you, but if if you're going out and you have to put on a jacket, like how do you wear your shawls? That's to me, that's a different thing than wearing them as like part of the outfit or like inside or something. Um, so um, do it the regular way and then it's also like just leaving it over your shoulders and not pulling it all the way forward. Sit on my knees here too. That's kind of nice. Well, it just also makes me feel a little warmer right now. Um, but there's also these, which could be loop underneath. Yeah, probably loop underneath like that. Um, this is probably, although it looks like a bow, probably the way that I see a lot of guys wear, like guy knitters, male knitters, wear their shawls and stuff. They kind of tie it in the front. So this would fit under a coat better. It's so cozy. Um, but also, wrapping it again and tucking in the tails. If it is cooled out and we're going to be walking around. Yeah. So this is probably when you give your neck, neck some space, probably my favorite way. It's so light. Then it's like a cowl. I just feel with the way that my coats sort of lay on me that I need everything to be kind of like this. But anyway. I hope that you have a great weekend and you did some fun things. And I hope to do more progress on my designs and um, that I can show you more mitten. Really, really love to get this mitten done today so I can block it. Uh, Cause this yarn is um, really beautiful when it's bloomed. Right now it's inside out because how this whole dealio is working, I use the word dealio. I don't really say that word in normal life that much, but I've said it twice today. Um, the cuff will be cabled on the outside, then you do reverse stockinette, which is why it's looking like regular stockinette right now. And then the cuff on the top will be folded over, so I had to cable it inside out which I just find really fun. I don't know if like little things like that. You do like this little short row, um, just one little German short row. I'm debating even calling it a short row cause I don't want to like freak people out. They're like, oh no, a short row. And I'm like, so easy. You just turn your work and you do this little thing with the stitch and then you start working inside out. And it's helpful to actually 
flip the mitten inside out too. And then you cable. So when I, if I was to flip this the way that it would be when you would actually wear it, the cable on the top would then be on the inside. But when you fold it over your hand, so you're getting like a double layer here, it'll have the cable on the outside. And then um, I did put a little, well, sorry, it's inside out. I did put a little cable on the thumb, just like I did with Zever. Here's my other mitten pattern. Because I really love thumb cables. Ugh, so love them. Okay, this is a delicate process. Well, the needles are still on here on my stitch marker. So here's the little thumb. It's running up the whole, whoop, the whole cuff and into the thumb, which looks great. And uh, yeah, it's going to be super adorable and hopefully really, really toasty for my market days when I'm standing outside on the street for five hours, regardless of the weather and temperature. And I need, um, I bought a big new like parka and I'm going to have some fingerless mittens. I'm going to have glamper gloves, everything to keep me toasty. So anyway, I'll let you go now. <laughs> um, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you later.